Hi, my name is Gina Feinstein. I am a fourth year graduate student at the University of Chicago, and today I'm very excited to be speaking with you about extracting light curves from the test full frame images. I will cover the general methods used by different teams within the community, and at the end, provide tutorials on how to go about retrieving these light curves. No talk about the test full frame images would be complete without this picture here. This is showing the full coverage of tests from its primary mission, years one and two. Tests covered about 80% of the sky and will fill in some of these gaps during the extended mission. The full frame images, which are taken every 30 minutes or 10 minutes in the extended mission, contain approximately 10 million stars brighter than a test magnitude of 16, but only 200,000 of these stars are observed at a higher cadence. This would mean that there would be a lot of science missed if we didn't have a way to build light curves from these full frame images directly. The full frame images really broaden the science that can be achieved with tests. In addition to the primary goal of detecting more transiting exoplanets, we can also study millions of individual stars and look for things like eclipsing binaries, stellar flares, or pulsations to learn about stellar interiors, like with this Delta Scuti star. Because TESS is staring at the sky, this also provides an opportunity to catch extragalactic events such as supernovae. And even a little closer to home, we can catch solar system bodies like Ceres. Because the full frame images are massive, taking up tens of gigabytes for a single sector, the question then becomes what is the best way to handle these images and how do we go about extracting light curves from them? There are three main techniques that I will highlight in this talk. The first technique is called aperture photometry. At the core, aperture photometry relies on multiplying the pixels from the full frame images by some mask and then summing each frame up. The easiest way to do this is by first cutting out a target pixel file, which is a smaller region, approximately 13 by 13 pixels, centered on your target. For this example, I've chosen a simple 2 by 2 binary mask that is centered on my star. More complicated masks, such as ones that are unique shapes, different sizes, or the pixels are weighted, can also be used. The best way to go about extracting a target pixel file is by either using the test cut tool provided by MAST or some software tools uh, will provide those for you. Once you sum up the masked target pixel file, you are left with a light curve, which for this target looks something like this. You can see there is a lot of stuff other than astrophysics going on in the light curve, such as constant momentum dumps and background noise and systematics. The test data products have quality flags which tell you which data points are good for, to use for science and which have been affected by instrument systematics. You can apply these quality flags to the light curve and now you have something that looks more usable for your science goals. But for high quality light curves, you need a little bit more than just applying an aperture mask. Additional corrections can be done, such as estimating and removing the background issues seen within tests. Here is an example of the background flux over time. You see large ramp ups at the beginning of each orbit and bumps going down all the way, which is a result of reflected earthshine being picked up in the cameras. There are a few ways to go about removing the background. The first and probably most common way is by identifying background pixels within the target pixel file. You want to identify as many pixels as you can without catching any nearby stars. This can be challenging for stars in crowded regions, so you may want to do something a little bit fancier, like estimating the background from the entire full frame image a kind of larger cutout around the target pixel file, or by trying to model the background with some two-dimensional model. I will highlight a two-dimensional model in a few slides. The other way you can go about removing systematics from the light curve is through principal component analysis, or PCA. For this method, the test team takes the brightest, least crowded stars observed at two-minute cadence on the same full frame image and identifies components, essentially eigenvectors, between the light curves that are similar. You can see here it captures long-term trends in the instrument, some earth shine at around 15 days, and that messy stuff at around 22 days. The first handful of components tend to capture large test systematics. The more components you build, the more chances you have to catch actual astrophysics in the component, which is not what you want. So we recommend only using the first five or so components in an attempt to clean your light curve. Depending on your science goals, you may also want to apply detrending techniques to your light curve. For more discussion on that, I will refer you to Rodrigo Luger's talk. The second technique that has been used is called difference imaging. Here you're looking at the difference between each full frame image and some reference frame from those observations. When you subtract the reference frame, you can get a very different view of what is going on on the pixel level. Here, I'll simultaneously play the raw, raw target pixel file on the left and the difference image target pixel file on the right, where you can see from the start that they look very different. 
Difference imaging is more so a different technique to try and remove background, bad background, and test systematics. After subtracting the reference frame from the raw target pixel file, you still have to apply an aperture to extract the pixels that are directly relevant to your star. Then you sum up each frame the same way we did with aperture photometry and create a light curve. Difference imaging is a great technique to highlight dramatic changes within the pixels. These events can be anything from super flares, like what was seen on the previous slide, supernova events, and even solar system objects crossing along the image, a few of which can be seen in this relatively small cutout already. That was the very basic picture. There is definitely more to difference imaging than subtracting a reference frame. Here, I want to highlight the steps taken by Montalto et al. that were used to extract light curves from the test full frame images. They follow six steps to produce the final image. The first, they download the raw full frame images. Then they create a high signal to noise, median stacked reference image for a given sector, camera, CCD combination. They filter the image to remove large flux variations and smooth the result to create the background model. The background model nicely captures large scale background systematics such as the reflected earth shine. The background model is then convolved with the reference image and subtracted from the raw full frame image to create the final image. You can see with this example alone how much cleaner the full frame image looks after it has been corrected. The third and last technique I wanna highlight is point spread function modeling. The point spread function, or PSF, is the response of your detector's pixels to a point source. For tests, the PSF changes greatly as a function of where you are on the detector. While these images shown here are the simulated pixel response function across the detector for Plato, they give the general sense of how shapes changes and how challenging they can be to model. A more simplistic approach, such as two summed up Gaussian profiles, can be used to roughly estimate the PSF across the detector, and has been shown to create nice, clean light curves from the test full frame images. But they do not accurately capture the full pixel response function. Many teams within the test community have extracted light curves from the full frame image and made them publicly available en masse as high-level science products. Each of the teams highlighted on the previous slide have approached extracting light curves using different techniques, all of which revolve around the three methods that were described previously, and each team had different science goals in mind. So the question then becomes, how do I choose which light curve is best for my science? Here, I will go through each of the teams highlighted on the previous slide, talk about their general light curve extraction technique and their science goals. There are four teams that optimize their light curve extraction for general exoplanet searches. And they're highlighted here in bold. The Diamante Difference Imaging Pipeline is the pipeline that I used before to highlight all of those individual steps on how to go from a raw full frame image to a background model to a corrected full frame image. The Diamante Pipeline provides multi-sector stitch light curves to enable searches for long period planets. The Diamante team not only provides light curves to the community, but they also provide the outputs of their exoplanet searches. For this, they use a random forest machine learning classification system, system to find new transiting exoplanets. Here on the right, I am showing their efficiency for injected planets, where they are really able to recover these uh, bigger planets on smaller periods, which is pretty typical for exoplanet injection and recovery. Um, and have a challenging time finding planets at longer periods. The Eleanor pipeline for which I am the lead software developer is more of a choose your own adventure software that helps guide you to the light curve that has that is the best for exoplanet transit searches. The way we do this is by testing a suite of different apertures per each star and trying to minimize the combined differential photometric precision or CDPP. This metric basically tells you how much scatter is in your light curve outside of transit events. So for this top light curve here, this is just the raw Eleanor flux. And you can see that there are some dips going on, which might actually be exoplanet transits. When we try to minimize the combined differential photometric precision, we mask anything with a standard deviation outside of the median of the light curve that's greater than around two and a half, which results in this uh, darker gray light curve below it and then measure the combined differential photometric precision from there. So this is just one example of how we go about doing that. But behind the scenes, you can do this for any star. And we also provide different fluxes to help you achieve different science goals if you're not particularly interested in searching for transiting exoplanets.
The MIT Quick Look Pipeline applies a difference imaging technique and light curve correction to optimize flux outputs for transit searches. After subtracting a reference frame and extracting the light curves, they convert the difference fluxes to absolute fluxes by adding in the expected flux from the source based on the test magnitude provided in the tip. The detrended light curves are combined from different sectors by offsetting the median with the expected test magnitude. And so they do provide light curves that are stitched across multiple sectors. The Science Processing Operations Center, our SPOC team, also provide light curves for an additional 160,000 stars that are observed within each full frame image per each sector. The additional targets that are selected are optimized for exoplanet searches, and they take the following steps. First, they search for targets that have an H magnitude brighter than 10 or a distance closer than 100 parsecs, which both result in infrared bright and nearby stars that are good for exoplanet follow-up. They then look for stars that are in not too crowded regions and limit the search to test magnitudes of brighter than 16 to provide high precision light curves. After this initial cut, they do a secondary cut that limits the stars to test magnitude brighter than 13 and a half that have surface gravities of greater than 3.5, which limits it to dwarfs and subgiants. And they do an additional cut on the crowdedness of where your star is by requiring 80% of the flux to be in the aperture from the target. Because TESS is an all-sky survey, this is really giving us the first view of planets around different stellar ages. This is because young stars tend to be scattered across the sky, so previous missions like Kepler or K2 only looked at a handful of young stars, while TESS is observing nearly all of them. There have been two teams that are focused on extracting light curves for young stars with the hopes of finding new young transiting exoplanets. The first team is the Cluster Difference Imaging Photometric Survey, or CDIPS which leverages difference imaging to extract light curves in crowded regions. Here is a map of TESS's observing sectors, where you see the continuous viewing zones highlighted in these dark circles going down to the ecliptic plane. The stars that are highlighted in blue are the stars that are covered by the CDIP survey. To date, there are around 600,000 light curves available. The team specifically looks at stars in open clusters and members of young moving groups and associations that were identified with a combination of archival searching of catalogs and Gaia information. The whole survey has a total of about 1 million stars. Because I personally find young stellar light curves to be so beautiful and so interesting, I wanted to highlight some of the light curves that have been extracted by the CDIPS team. They focus on creating high precision light curves for thousands of young stars and have found things like uh, spot modulation, young eclipsing binaries, and even some young transiting exoplanets. The light curves are detrended using principal component analysis and a trend filtering algorithm, which is optimized for transit searches. But both light curves, trended, detrended, and non-detrended, are provided to the community. The second team I want to highlight is the Pathos team, which uses Gaia information to identify young stars and a combination of point spread function modeling and background removal to extract these light curves. Here what I am showing in the blue and red points are the stars for the input list of years one and two of tests. And I encourage you to look at all of the papers in the Pathos series for more information about their target selection. The Pathos team has also been vetting their light curves for exoplanet candidates, binaries, and other variable stars. All of this information can be found within their series of papers. And so I recommend you check those out for more information. At the beginning of this talk, I highlighted that the test full frame images are great for science other than looking for transiting exoplanets. But all of the pipelines that I have talked about so far have been focused on extracting light curves, high precision light curves for exoplanet transit searches. Here, I'll talk about two additional teams that have a focus of not finding exoplanets, but doing other kinds of science within the test full frame images. The first team that I want to highlight is the Olkers and Stassen Difference Imaging Pipeline that applies the difference imaging technique that we talked about earlier and applies a fixed aperture to a selected sample of stars. Their light curves are available via filter graph. And so if you, this is a screenshot from their website and you can go in and put in any tick ID or RA and DEC to filter on. And if you click on the point, you will get the light curve. So here's just an example of one light curve that I've extracted using the filter graph portal. The next team that I want to highlight is the TESS Astroseismic Science Operations Center, or TASOC team. They apply aperture photometry to the stars within the full frame images 
and optimize their light curve extraction for looking for astroseismic pulsations. The way that they choose their aperture is by using a clustering algorithm, where here I have shown several stars within the same target pixel file, and their aperture is highlighted in black. The red color are the weights applied to each pixel, pixel within the aperture, and so you can see that they're highly weighted towards the center of the star, with a less weight towards the edges. They also provide light curve corrections that are primarily based on target movement on the CCD, both in one dimension and two dimension. And these are some examples of the light curves that they have extracted so far. Here is a summary slide of all publicly available full frame image light curves, their team, their science goal, the extraction method that they used, and where they are available as high level science products on MAST. I've put the name of the team in the backslash that you can add to the link at the top of the column if you want to go to that team's light curves directly. The only team that does not have light curves on MAST are the Olgers and Stassen Difference Imaging Pipeline, which can be found at this filter graph link here. I also want to plug the TESS FFI Pipeline Splinter Session on Thursday, where we'll go into more details about how light curves from different groups compare to each other. So now for the last few minutes of my talk, I want to go about discussing how we can actually retrieve these light curves. If you decide to stop watching this video now, I guess you can take away that there are two main ways to go about retrieving these light curves. The first one is through MAST or Astral Query, or the light curve with a K package, or you can use the LNR pipeline. Light curve with a K is a fully open source Python package that is truly the one-stop shop for your light curve manip manipulation needs. Here, I've just taken the demonstration video that is provided on the light curve documentation website to show exactly all of the things that you can do very easily within this package. And so for more information on light curve, you can go to the link that I've provided below. Light curve also interacts with masks very easily and so what you can actually do is search for any light curve file that is available on MAST from any of these different pipelines and download them directly. And here I will play a short video tutorial about how to go about doing that. The other software that you can use to extract light curves is the Eleanor pipeline. And so for this, you can pip install Eleanor, download the software, and create the light curve for anything that's in the test full frame images with three simple lines. I also want to highlight that if you're looking at targets uh, from sectors 14 and onward, we're using Test Cut behind the scene, which is an amazing tool that was developed by Clara Browser at, te at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And so here I will play a quick video about how we go about extracting light curves using Eleanor and also have provided the link to the documentation below. And so with that, we've come to the end of my talk. I hope that you've learned something about the different methods that have been used to extract light curves from the test full frame images that specifically boil down to three, aperture photometry, difference imaging, and point spread function modeling. There are lots of amazing teams that are creating light curves from the full frame images and are making them publicly available to the community. But it's important to keep in mind the different science goal each team has when trying to choose the light curve that's best for your science case. While most of them are exoplanet focused, there are also some that are more stellar focused, that are more generalized, and also some that provide hands-on experience with the software so you can create whatever kind of light curve that you want. There are many different tools to create and download these pre-made light curves, but specifically I would like to highlight going through the light curve with a K package or through Astro Query. And one of the main takeaways that I want you to take is that when possible, if, when you're looking for a signal in your light curve, when available, you should search as many light curves as you can because each team uses a different processing pipeline. And so in order to truly validate these signals, you wanna make sure that each team can find them and so when possible, use as many light curves as you can. Thank you.